Thank you, Dr. Walker Smith, for that powerful address, the um, integral linking of ecumenism and oikumene in John 1, uh, 17, uh, John 17, to not only Christian unity, but unity of all peoples and unity of the whole inhabited earth. The uh, response, we are very fortunate tonight to have a distinguished respondent from the Episcopal Church of Liberia. He is coming in from Liberia, and we're grateful um, that Dr. Reverend Dr. Herman Brown can be with us. Um, Dr. Brown uh, has served as uh, Dean of the Trinity Cathedral in Monrovia. He also served recently as the uh, president of uh, Cuttington uh, University, if I have that correct, yes, in uh, Liberia. Uh, he received his uh, Bachelor of Divinity from King's College in London, his PhD from the University of London there. And he, we are extremely blessed that Dr. Herman Brown will um, soon be with us here in the consortium. He will come to the Center for Anglican Communion Studies at Virginia Theological Seminary to serve as a resident scholar. And we look forward to further engagement with him. He has a number of uh, theological books uh, eight of them, in fact, so I hope that you can read those in the program and um, explore them. So, uh, Reverend Dr. Brown, we are delighted and uh, we invite you to offer your uh, reflections as response. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Thank you very much. I uh, greet you here from Liberia, and I hope that uh, uh, wherever you are, there is a uh, sense in which we all feel very grateful to Dr. Walker Smith for that brilliant presentation. I am particularly pleased that she was able to articulate in my mind um, the hopes of the Pan-African people and enable us to see just what she means by uh, it, the vision of visible unity being deferred. It seems to me that her, her vision and her passion for praxis, as she calls it, practical, sustainable action towards visible reconciliation of races um, is an important element in our own vision, we believe, God's own vision for his world. And also, I think it was important in hearing her speak to reflect on how we traditionally use the word of ecumenism and how we expect that from visible Christian unity, there should not be much else beyond that, which we, we count as probably ecumenical. But I could quite understand how she, she used the word ecumenism and how many of us will quite rightly use it to include all peoples of, of, of the universe or of the inhabited worlds. And so I, I was grateful to see how she, she jumped straight into that and with some clarity drew out for us why it is uh, that it seems uh, despairing uh, for uh, peoples of African descent, uh, that up to this stage, we aren't further along uh, the path of racial justice, or at least equity uh, and inclusiveness. I also think um, in the presentation, she made some helpful clarifications, or at least disclaimers regarding Ubuntu as a concept. And as a way of getting into the vision that we all expect we would share of what peoples of African descent desire. But I wanted um, to, to highlight a few other aspects of Ubuntu that resonated with her point. Uh, and the first has to do with 
something that might be regarded as theoretical or conceptual, uh, but it does have very practical implications. Um, Ubuntu as a concept insists on dialogue. Uh, and dialogue is not just speech, it is a real engagement with the other. It is finding a space sufficiently neutral, uh, if not a neutral space, at least a shared space owned by uh, contending parties um, where they are committed to having a conversation. So a conversation in my mind, it's not just about understanding each other or agreeing with each other. It's about recognizing that the other is not going away and recognizing the reality of the, the uh, existence, yes, but the issues that affect the other. The second thing about Ubuntu I think I wanted to draw out is also that apart from just insisting on dialogue, and uh, there is an openness to the other that goes with it. Um, and in that openness, I think there is a daring, uh, a daring insistence on meeting. And meeting means bringing to one's mind, one's soul, one's uh, being, of the presence and the soul of the other person. When Jesus said that we should, we should, uh, the disciples should go to Jerusalem, he didn't just say go to Jerusalem and I will, I will, I will be there. He said, I will meet you all there. It was important that they met in Jerusalem. Meeting is very important. <laughs> or Christians and, and meeting in worship places, that's important. I mean, the physical meeting of the other as part of the dialogue means that the potential for conflict, but also the potential for honesty and for progress in relationships is a real and viable prospect. I am not certain that we've made much effort even in our Christian communities to, to have uh, intentional conversations around these issues as Dr. Walker Smith has so clearly outlined. And I think that could be something we could venture towards. Uh, I don't want to go much further into that. I, I, I think the, uh, I, I saw some questions coming out that I would be very interested to hearing an answer to. Uh, and let me just throw my last comment would be a question myself to Dr. Walker Smith, uh, which is this. Um, how would you draw the imperative of Jesus's prayer that we all may be one? How do you move it from the oneness of Christians to oneness of all peoples, or the unity of Christians to the unity of all peoples? And I think I'll, I'll stop there. I'll leave, I'll leave right there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brown. Um, we. Uh, we will now turn to a time of uh, question and answer. Uh, and uh, I continue to invite the um, participants today to submit your questions in the chat box, uh, send them to everyone uh, so that we can view them. Maybe we'll be stimulated with um, other questions as well. We uh, do have about uh, 40 minutes uh, for uh, questions, um, 30 or 40 minutes. and. Um, uh, so we uh, encourage you to submit those. At this point, I think I will begin uh, by asking um, Dr. Walker Smith um, just to respond to uh, uh, Herman Brown's uh, question about relating um, uh, the John, uh, uh, the prayer of Jesus and in, in, in John uh, about the uh, unity of Christians with the unity of all peoples. 
First and foremost, thank you so much, Dr. Brown. You certainly honor me by having a reflection of any sort relative to my presentation. And thank you for being up very late in Liberia uh, to be a part of this conversation. I salute you. Uh, uh, I salute you. Um, yeah, I mean, the question of oneness of peoples versus the oneness we speak in the Christian faith. I, I mean, I think the good news is that we do have scriptures like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So I, I just think God's love, God's divine love surpasses the boundaries that we have put up as I think artificial binaries that prevent us for being able to be fully engaged with all of God's people. You know, I, I look at someone like Jesus when he walked the earth. I mean, uh, Jesus walked with all kinds of people that the uh, certainly the Jewish community did not approve of and the Gentile community did not approve of. I mean, I think that's part of the point. I mean, I, I think that's actually part of the point of being a Christian is that our hearts should be open to the various expressions of all the peoples that God has created in the genius of God. What we have to figure out is what is the spirit, the attitude, and again, the praxis of what that means in various contexts that are very, very diverse. And, and I think that takes a posture of great humility, uh, that takes a posture of really deferential uh, 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 opportunity uh, to those who are the most unfamiliar to us. Uh, I will say that uh, I think the, the ecumenical journey is actually a practice, should be a practice of how one does that. And I'm happy to see where the ecumenical family has had opportunities through faith and order and through practical exercises of praxis relative to groups that are of the various faith traditions. Uh, I made mention of this kind of global ethic uh, that many of our churches have been a part of and thinking through with the Parliament of World Religions. I mean, I think that that kind of document is a very helpful piece uh, in being able to plot some ways forward to deepen what has already begun uh, for several decades now. Thank you very much. Um, any any uh, response to that, uh, Dr. Brown? Any other words? No, thank you. I, I'm, I'm okay with that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. May I ask you what time it is there? Is it two in the morning? It's one in the morning. One in the morning. That's early. That's, that's late enough. Thank you, sir. <laughs> that's why we salute you. <laughs> uh, I do too. Thank you so much. Sorry, we, let me move to some other questions. And again, we continue to invite more. Um, this, uh, I would open up to uh, Dr. Walker Smith, but be interested if, if Dr. Brown has any um, response also. Um, is it worth uh, exploring a Truth and Reconciliation Commission here in the US uh, as they did in South Africa? Or is it uh, too late, too long since the Emancipation Proclamation to do so? Well, my initial response would be that my understanding is such consideration is already underway. Uh, there are conversations in the US context to do exactly that. Uh, it has not uh, reached the point of maturity to launch, but I do know that there have been discussions relative to doing exactly that. Uh, I think the question for those who are preparing a launch of that sort is to what extent the government should be involved or not, or how the government should be involved or not. I, I think that's partly where the debate is in terms of how such uh, an initiative would be launched in the United States. Um, uh, I, I believe any opportunity to really reckon with the history that I've outlined a bit in my presentation uh, is inviting. Um, but I think the uh, kind of Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the United States will look a bit different from the one in South Africa. Um, and, and so I think all of these different best practices uh, need to be adjusted and carefully thought through for the context in which one finds themselves. I mean, that kind of commission here versus say in, um, in London, uh, you, know, in, you know, in England, if I may, would be very different from here. So 
I, I think we have to be very careful that there are best practices, but we have to have careful regard for what that looks like. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, Dr. Brown, if you wish uh, to respond, just raise your, uh, raise your hand for me uh, to a question. You're welcome to. Any thoughts about a Truth and, and Reconciliation Commission for us? Well, well, I think, I think um, that Dr. Walker Smith would know much uh, uh, better about the situation in the United States, but certainly in terms of any truth and reconciliation, there are always uh, uh, issues of uh, legality and whether uh, uh, crimes of that nature, if they're considered crimes, have any statute of limitation and therefore connected to any such commission would be considerations of, of uh, uh, punishment and the justice, the justice system. And I think that, as you said, needs to be thought through if that's the road you want to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. It, that whole process reminds me of um, a restorative justice practices of uh, people meeting face to face um, and um, uh, owning up to their wrongdoing. Um, and, and I'm just curious if restorative justice um, uh, principles or practice are kind of central, um, uh, Dr. Walker Smith, to the process that you see uh, we need to undergo? Yeah, I mean, certainly, I mean, regardless of how the actual formulation of the methodology is put together, the values are consistent. And I think those values, to some extent, were explained in my presentation. But I mean, the good news is that we do have best practices that go before us that have been deeply engaged some of those principles that I believe are biblical, yes, principles of Ubuntu, but I also think there are some other values that can help us to create such an opportunity leading to not only reparations, but then also eventually reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to uh, share this question from one of our uh, uh, people in the audience uh, this evening. What uh, critical interfaith uh, partners uh, are at work or needed to um, build a lasting unity for um, humankind uh, and for uh, the human communities? Um, and when uh, and where are those bridges being built effectively as you've seen them in interfaith terms? Yeah, I mean, I think that we've had interfaith discussions for decades now that have been just really very helpful. I mean, some of those conversations have been in smaller conversations. Uh, the Parliament of World Religion has had, I think, larger opportunities for that. Uh, the Religions for Peace also has a larger platform for those kinds of engagements globally and, and both have very helpful leadership in this, in this moment. Um, the, the Conceal Your Bodies have for decades engaged in uh, interfaith conversations through faith and order and other aspects of the work, um, in the, even in the conversations around world evangelism and mission, those conversations have had to be held because, as we know, in many parts of the world, Christianity is the minority religion. Uh, you know, you look at places like India and some other places we can name, uh, China, etc., um, so this has been out of necessity of nothing else uh, to try and figure out what is a way forward to show God's love. And I would also argue God's justice relative to all of God's people. So that's the good news. Now, I do think in the Western approach to interfaith relations, we can do a better job in moving outside of the monotheistic religions. I think to a great extent in the United States, we've mostly focused on the monotheistic religions. I think we can do better in terms of various religions of spirituality, um, traditional religions, uh, also what have been traditionally called quote unquote polytheistic religions. I mean, I just think we can do a better job because the world is so much bigger uh, than what it is that the westernized more colonial approach to religion and spiritualities have been. And, and to really overcome the, the historically pejorative uh, language and even uh, attitudes toward these various expressions. I mean, in the end, uh, we, we've got to figure out what it means to live together. And 
it seems to me those in the Christian church have a unique position to lead to help us figure that out by some of the principles that Dr. Brown even just mentioned a moment ago uh, around various values of a bulletin. Thank you very much. Um, for our audience, uh, I'd just like you to know about the Interfaith Conference of Metropolitan Washington, uh, which has a number of faith communities as uh, members and engages many others, but they have a strong representation of Dharmic faiths from, uh, from the East as well. Um, and, you know, they often hold uh, kind of table talk conversations at a very, very local level. Um, Face to face, it, it reminds me, Dr. Brown, of your speaking about um, uh, meeting and, and, and encountering the other, learning to receive uh, the other. Um, and do you do you think those kind of local um, face to face kind of gatherings uh, have some uh, value and impact over time? Both of you. Well, I'm pleased. To, go ahead, Dr. Brown. You go first. <laughs> Well, I, 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 I think they do. I think they do. I think they, um, they, they, they first of all, uh, initiate relationships that are later on either used in, ter in times of conflict uh, and they generate better understanding. And I, I think they, they, they move towards uh, just a better appreciation of the differences uh, that are amongst peoples. Uh, and I, I would, I would really, I would really encourage, encourage us to look, look more and more, more at that. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I would say that uh, as one who's been the executive or the, uh, you know, the pre-executive of the Council of Churches in Indiana, that working with uh, both the ecumenical and the interfaith, and even I would say multi-faith community, was key to being able to build bridges, particularly when 9-11 happened. Uh, when 9-11 happened, I was in Indiana, and unfortunately, it was many of our Muslim and Sikh brothers and sisters who were so affected by violent assaults, by those in the society who felt that they were the object of what the challenges were around 9-11. I am very pleased that, that the Council of Churches where I was, we had already built relationships with the Islamic Society of North America in Plainfield, just outside of Indianapolis and the Sikh community. And so when it was time for 9-11, when it happened, that we were able to mobilize quickly and to convince the local newspaper that there needed to be a full page ad paid for by their donors in order to have the interests of the society to come together. And it is that kind of proactive work, not just reactionary work, that can help us even in this moment where we see these kinds of affronts and violent assaults happening time and time again, where there are AAPI communities, our Jewish communities, and others we can name, including communities of African and African descent. Thank you very, very much. Um, your experience in that regard is, is um, invaluable and, and enlightening. Um, I uh, wanted to uh, turn now to a question about um, your, um, your title uh, of your position, Dr. Walker-Smith. Uh, in your uh, title, uh, you have the word, the word Orthodox faith along with Pan-African uh, uh, engagement. Or, and uh, is that referring to uh, Orthodox churches per se in, uh, in Africa, like uh, the Church of uh, Alexandria, uh, or does that include more broadly? And then I have a follow-up question to that. Well, thank you for the question. It actually is more broadly uh, of Orthodox churches, Eastern and Oriental lineages, um, and even lineages that have been children of those <laughs> lineages, if you will. Um, so I'm very pleased that Bread for the World has welcomed uh, this kind of affirmation of working with the Orthodox community, as well as many others. I mean, there are others who have portfolios as well. Um, but yes, there is a particular regard in my, in my understanding relative to Orthodox churches that are ancient, that are of African identity. Uh, certainly, unfortunately, when we speak of church history too often, we, we miss the opportunity 
to not only name the Middle East as a place of the Holy Lands, but of the Horn of Africa as the center of ancient Christianity. And here we are reminded of the Coptic church in Egypt, the Ethiopian Orthodox church of over 45 million adherents, uh, the Eritrean Orthodox community. Uh, I mean, th this is what we're talking about in terms of rewriting the narrative <laughs> and, and mainstreaming the, the various stories and histories and her stories that need to be a part of our fuller understanding, not only of church history, but of the public narratives. So yes, I am very honored that Bread for the World has welcomed this particular emphasis in the work that I do. Uh, so thank you for the question. Thank you. The, the follow-up uh, from the same uh, questioner is, um, uh, understanding that the Russian Orthodox Church is now trying to form dioceses and churches in Africa itself. And is that disruptive to uh, ecumenical dialogue and engagement or what, how do you analyze that situation? Well, if I may, historically, churches have always done that to other churches, right? I mean, that's part of what the scramble for Africa was about, the missionary period, where the Protestant churches got together and said, you take this, I'll take that. Oh no, we shouldn't. I mean, this is part of the history of the church. I, I don't feel we should single out the Russian Orthodox Church from this history that is a long narrative of what has gone forth before ahead of this moment. I am an ecumenist and I do think ecumenical protocols matter. So I'm one who thinks, you know, we ought to be talking to each other <laughs> as well as talking to public society if we are going to believe in the oneness that Christ has called us to. This is one of the uh, uh, sadnesses of our not being able to be a fellowship, not just conceal you, but a fellowship that has a mutual regard, that has protocols that has disciplines around how we regard one another. So I'm very much encouraging that we as Christians talk to each other, regardless of the histories that we have known. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, I have a, a conservative evangelical uh, uh, family in Texas, and they're so proud they've been a part of taking Bibles to Russia like they never had them before. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh boy, I'll tell you. Um, uh, God, God bless them. Uh, at least they're free. I, I, I'll say that. Uh, so, um, I want to uh, uh, move on now to another area of um, of topics, and um, uh, it's it's in relation to your uh, very um, thoughtful and. Um, careful discussion of uh, reparations and, and what that might look like. We have a question um, from Errol um, that um, even sometimes he says, uh, even those who have been harmed have different views of what reparations might look like. So is there any consensus among institutions, uh, leading institutions of color, especially in the US uh, that, um, about what that might look like and uh, how to move forward? Well, I'm very grateful for the question. Um, in November of last year, there was, an, uh, his, I think, to a great extent, a historic meeting of local and regional and state leaders who are engaged in repair just, reparatory justice movements locally and statewide uh, that came together in Evanston, Illinois, you may know, in Evanston, Illinois, not only have they argued for reparations, but it has been granted and is being implemented around issues around healthcare. Uh, in Asheville, North Carolina, in California, in the state legislature, we have some various movements that are taking place around these issues, not only HR 40 or uh, the Senate Bill 40 uh, that is in discussion as we speak. So what that shows us is that in this kind of coming together that was held in November, that there are diverse approaches to how different communities are understanding the principles 
of reparatory justice. I think this is critically important. It goes back to the comments I was making about a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, there are principles that undergird various communities. Uh, you know, this kind of a uniform thinking as opposed to this kind of a diversity of thinking uh, is really quite important when we talk about what moves us toward visible unity and toward the gift of the grace of unity. So um, I think what people need to do is think about what this means for you. You know, going back to that Ubuntu question, who am I? <laughs> who are we? Uh, I think that's how change comes. It's local municipalities, it's state municipalities, as well as federal policies that need to come together. Uh, this country was built on movements from local and state communities. I mean, if you just look now with the debate around voting rights, I mean, it's the 19 states <laughs> right now who are pushing back on full uh, rights around uh, around voting that is leading this whole conversation federally around what does voting rights mean in this moment. So we have to be again looking at praxis that where we engage these principles uh, in customized ways of where we are. And so um, I think uh, reparations, reparatory justice, all of that may look different. That being said, however. At the federal levels, what's exciting about the HR 40 is that it's saying we want to consider the research. We want to consider the data. This is critically important today if we want to have the impact. And from there, from those conversations, from that kind of research, then to formulate what does it mean to come up with proposals for the United States at a federal level. So that is one reason why many of us certainly support that particular legislation because we need that kind of infrastructure and that kind of affirmation of our representatives to say, let's have that difficult conversation, which I want to remind everyone, we had during the reconstruction period. Mm -hmm. This is not a new conversation, friends. That's what I was trying to point out. We, we've been here before, again, incremental reforms that have regressed. So we've got a history. Can we get back to what we said we would try to do even in the 1800s, where we not only regressed, but we went very far back when we actually gave reparations to white planters who had enslaved Pan-African peoples. That's in the history. So there is a precedent for reparations not only with them, but other groups we could talk about that we don't have time to discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned reconstruction, and I am personally um, struck by where you are this very night uh, at Villa Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, just want our audience to know that uh, the first, um, there was a strong uh, free public school for um, uh, former enslaved peoples and um, uh, for freed, freedmen as well, uh, founded in the basement of, uh, of Beulah Baptist. Um, but in addition, it was the first uh, theological, normal and theological school founded in the period of reconstruction period in the entire country by uh, Reverend Clem Robinson, um, who yes. had been a former slave in, in Virginia, uh, educated at Lincoln University. And I'm just uh, very touched about the poignancy of where you are this evening in that in that great in that great legacy. Um, well, Dr. Coleman, may I just say thank you, because every time I enter this church and know whose hands built this church, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the people who came from the plantations of enslavement, who who not only built the school but built a sanctuary to celebrate the hope of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and what they had done. I, I, I bow down in my spirit every time I even come to the door. And so I thank you so much for that recognition. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm just a very, very, very moved about um, uh, this connection uh, this evening. Um, you mentioned uh, a couple of our schools, uh, 
that have been at the forefront of, of racial justice concerns since their founding, uh, like uh, Samuel D. Proctor and Howard, uh, that were founded after uh, the Beulah Baptist Normal and Theological School, uh, just to reiterate that. Um, the uh, the uh, other school that you did mention is Virginia Theological Seminary, and uh, they, uh, they still think, this may, may, um, may not be true, but they still think they are the first school of, of higher education in the United States that is beginning a, a direct cash reparations uh, program to uh, descendants, not only of enslaved peoples that were there, but uh, people who served the school during the, the Jim Crow period. And I'm just curious, and you mentioned the efforts uh, uh, that have been made at, at um, your alma mater, Princeton Seminary, there have been efforts at Georgetown University to address um, their ties with uh, uh, slavery. Um, and I'm just curious, how important are these smaller efforts? I mean, are, are these um, significant for local institutions, especially Christian institutions or related institutions to um, undertake reparations uh, or a reparatory justice program themselves? I think is very significant because it's just now happening. <laughs> I mean, unfortunately we don't, at least I'm not aware. And I'm glad to say that uh, I am not a historian. I took church history and all the rest, but I don't claim to be the historian. Um, but to my knowledge, uh, this kind of intentionality around scrutinizing the history uh, that engages scholarship that says, yes, we need to look back hundreds of years, as well as what has happened since the Jim Crow period. I think that's actually quite important. Um, now, uh, it's my understanding that the Black Caucus at Princeton Theological Seminary, for example, said, certainly that is not enough. Just like I said tonight, these things are not enough. We must look to praxis. <laughs> we must look to how we apply this great work that does need to be done, I believe, so that we can offer some opportunity to restore that history that has gone before us. So I think that is very important done in community. And, and what I mean is not only the Black Caucus, but also others who have graduated from that school, others who are the direct descendants of those who were those who were enslaved at that time or otherwise in servitude of some sort, it's important to talk with them as well. Th this is what we mean by community. This is what I think Ubuntu means is really having those tough conversations and not making unilateral decisions around what we have found by the people who found it, who are predominantly people who are not the most affected, mm -hmm. but we need to figure out where that tough conversation that Dr. Brown proposed around Ubuntu, which is also an aspect I didn't have time to go into, uh, relative to these great works. So I think it is, I think it is significant. And that's part of what is being asked for with HR 40, is to have that kind of wherewithal, those kinds of resources to do that for our nation. Thank you very much. I, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Brown, if I may, uh, about uh, discussions or movements towards reparations uh, in the African context uh, uh, in relationship to the, the global um, um, slave trade. And uh, it, you are on the West Coast of uh, Africa, which uh, was uh, one of the centers of, of great uh, of trade of, of uh, human bodies and, and black bodies for uh, enslavement throughout the uh, Caribbean and, and the Americas and, and elsewhere. Um, are there conversations in Africa about uh, global uh, rep repertory justice uh, for African peoples? Thank you. Um, those conversations, as far as I know, um, are taking place near Addis Ababa at the uh, AU, what we call the African Union. And I'm, I'm aware that they are, are steadily progressing because there are some moves now, I understand, to bring them to the fore uh, beyond just the, uh, the union. Mm -hmm. uh, that in, in locally, 
locally um, that isn't that isn't a subject we 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 venture into. Having said that, um, we ourselves here in Liberia have had a, a truth and reconciliation commission, hmm. and we had to deal with the uh, the uh, consequences of having had a com a tough conversation about perpetrators and victims uh, and what's what's needed having heard their confessions mm -hmm. so there are a, a few things around that that if you are going to have these frank discussions mm -hmm. and mean them in public then there are consequences that the community as a whole must deal with and reparations one of them yes yes thank yeah. you thank you very much um the uh Next question that um, has come in is uh, re it's it's related directed first to you, uh, Dr. Brown, and and then to uh, uh, Dr. Walker Smith as well. Um, both of you and Dr. Brown, you you mentioned this clearly the importance of me meeting the the, the meeting uh, together, meeting one another uh, to do the work of ecumenism and uh, live out the values of Ubuntu um, for uh, for you and Dr. Walker Smith. Um, how has the, the pandemic situation uh, thwarted that and the isolation created in many parts of the world thwarted the efforts of uh, moving forward with the ecumenical movement um, and uh, ecumenical engagement? Well, for me, um, clearly, I think everyone would, would uh, share something of the sentiment that uh, the COVID did affect and did bring to everyone's mind the value of meeting each other. Uh, the level of isolation and alienation and the level of just simple social disconnect um, uh, was clearly socially disturbing um, for our churches, for the pattern and the way in which we lived our lives in the community. Um, that was a problem, even socially for greeting. Uh, how we organize our communities here in, in, in West Africa and not being able to touch, to meet, to go near um, was very problematic and at some point traumatic. Mm. Uh, not, not being, not, and in fact, on top of that, on top of that, um, having social media so accessible and able to show how other places in the world were dealing with this and how they were being devastated by the by the virus um, uh, simply wasn't a very good feeling. The mm -hmm. I think pretty much the world was on pause, uh, mm -hmm. as you would know. Uh, and in terms of ecumenism, in terms of racial justice, I think all that was on the back burner. Mm -hmm. uh, at that stage, uh, it's not that it didn't matter, but at that stage, I mean, there wasn't too much of an injustice when nobody could meet anybody. I think the whole idea of uh, 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 racism and inequality will arise when you have to deal with the other. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there, there is where we must deal with it, when you have to deal with the other. I, and before, before I, I end there, let me say that I keep thinking of the reflection from, I think it was a student um, earlier in the uh, program, uh, the uh, person who reflected on the readings Mm -hmm. We mentioned about the, the Magi actually coming to Jerusalem and eventually to Bethlehem. And, you know, they, they, went, they didn't go there to know about Jesus. They went there to meet him. Mm -hmm. Meet him. It was important for them. And, mm -hmm. and so I think um, COVID um, affected that. And thank God um, it's receding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Walker-Smith, pandemic in... Uh, uh, implications and it, I'll add any any learnings during this period for ecumenism. Well, thank you so much. I, I think uh, one of the greatest sadness is not being able, certainly in uh, many of our Pan African churches, not being able to to hug each other, embrace each other with the love of Christ, and just simply say it's all right. <laughs> you know, it, it's as simple as that. You know, to 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 be touched and. Uh, to be embraced by the fellowship in our local congregations has just been very, very difficult. Uh, this has been one of the key elements of being congregated uh, together in a same space. And certainly before the advance of vaccines, 
uh, where this was strictly prohibited in many respects. Uh, in a very, very difficult period and a difficult period to adjust to that that was no longer the culture uh, that we could really employ that has kept us together over hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, so that's just been very difficult. Um, on the other hand, I will say that the uh, that this season, these past two years, has also given us a new opportunity, particularly to bring in our younger generations who have already made the adjustment to the digital age. Uh, it has forced some of the older ones to come alongside of the use of technology. It, it has freed and encouraged our young people to step up with support. They've always stepped up, but with support <laughs> for some of the elders uh, who are less uh, who are less hesitant, who are more hesitant uh, to receive the digital age. Um, recently, I was honored to, in fact, we'll go to Karlsruhe, to Germany for a fuller engagement of a breakthrough ecumenical report. I, I encourage all of you to take a look at it, uh, you know, looking at the digital age and ecumenism looking forward. Uh, there's a major report coming to the Central Committee this week that will go to Karlsruhe, um, bringing together world communicators in the ecumenical world and religious broadcasters, secular and sacred, together to say, what have we learned about the use of technology? I mean, right now, in this moment, we wouldn't be able to have the conversation if it wasn't for the digital moment that we're all living in right now. Yeah. So on that side of the coin, yes, but back to the other side of the conversation, what, what racism has really exposed in vaccine inequities is how far we need to go Mm -hmm. to ensure that all countries, so-called low and middle income countries, as well as so-called high income countries, are able to produce vaccines and other health care products and supplies everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not this reliance on so-called high income countries mm -hmm. to give because the giving is never equitable. Mm -hmm. It's always partial, it's always piecemeal. And that is the case right now as thousands of people die because they do not have access to the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, in countries that are so-called high income countries, some of us refuse to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to have a conversation about how it is we overcome these historic inequities that are still with us that literally causes death in our communities of God's people. And sadly, Pan-African peoples have been disproportionately affected by these issues. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, the scores and scores of deaths remind me of the power of lamentation and, and how powerful that is for Christian communities to get together for lamentation and, and services of grief and even on the interfaith level. And you have written about this, which, which is uh, a real gift to us. We will end our questions here. Uh, I do want to um, thank um, our participants uh, this evening, our student members um, who have been with us uh, to lead our Prayer for Christian Unity. I want to thank our speaker, uh, Dr. Walker Smith, and our respondent, uh, Dr. Henry uh, Herman Brown. Excuse me, Dr. Brown. Um, I do, however, want to uh, invite one member of our uh, board uh, uh, who has made the this evening possible, and uh, for uh, and others like it for 13 years, uh, Mr. Jack Fiegel, to uh, close us with uh, an announcement or two. Thank you, Larry, and uh, thank you uh, to uh, Dr. Walker Smith for a stunning presentation uh, and opening the eyes of, of many of us. Uh, and uh, hopefully your words will uh, continue to ring uh, for uh, a long time to come. Uh, and also Dr. Brown for your uh, steadfastness of staying up with us so late. And, and thank you for your your commentary and, and uh, your comments. I'd also like to thank the student board 
uh, for their participation and their prayer service, uh, the wonderful music uh, that we heard uh, earlier in the evening. And finally, to the Board of Trustees of the Consortium uh, that sponsors the Ecumenism Award uh, every year and selects a worthy scholar. Uh, you can see in the program the long list of ecumenical uh, awards that have been given uh, through the years. And uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Walker Smith, you now join that list and congratulations to you. Uh, I'd also like to thank Larry uh, for a stunning program, uh, wonderful moderation and to our support staff, Yvonne and Christy, uh, the hard work that they do in keeping the consortium uh, moving and keeping Larry on time. <laughs> My final announcement is to invite everyone to do a Google search and uh, join the uh, Orientale Lumen Conference that I organize and host in June. Uh, it's an ecumenical grassroots movement uh, here in the United States. Uh, for the last two years, because of the pandemic, we've gone virtual instead of the meeting face-to-face -face, as has just been discussed. Unfortunately, this year, because we're not yet quite recovered, uh, I've decided we're going to have virtual again. Uh, we have a, a stellar lineup of speakers on the topic of Nicaea and the date of Easter. Now, this is in preparation for the Council of Nicaea's anniversary coming up in three years, uh, the 1700th anniversary. But also for those of you who may not know, the Eastern churches and the Western churches calculate the date of Easter differently and celebrate in most years on a different day. And so this conference is going to bring that issue to the front and perhaps try to come up with some reconciliation or at least better understanding uh, of that. And I see Larry has posted the link. Thank you, Larry, for doing that for me. Uh, I invite everyone to come join us. It will be virtual and therefore you can join from anywhere in the world and, uh, and participate with us. Uh, again, thank you all to everyone who participated tonight. And we look forward to seeing you uh, next year, uh, uh, at least. Larry, back to you. Yes, thank you, Jack. And I just want to thank everyone for uh, spending this time with us this evening. It's been a, a remarkable evening, and we are blessed by, by your presence. Uh, God be with you, and uh, God keep us in unity that we know this evening, and uh, strengthen it with uh, everyone that we uh, come to know and uh, that we meet. Amen. Amen. Amen.